such amplification. <laughs> Do you have enough Thank light? You. Do you have enough light? Yeah, I brought my spelunking thing, but I don't need it tonight, so I'm not going to go spelunking for my poetry. So, I, you know, it's really quite an honor to read at this place. I think it's one of the best venues. And I'm sorry there are not more people here, not for me, but this is a very cool place to read poetry. A very historic place. So, um, I read here before a couple of years ago with Leonard, and um, at that time I read poems without uh, giving titles, and I was just uh, focused on content. I take a breath uh, uh, between them. So, pretty much I'm going to stick with that rather than stopping at every one and talk about how I arrived at this, the title of the poem, and so that you can hopefully uh, enjoy the content of the poem. In the first moments, the universe rolled the dice between the particles of matter and antimatter. What remained was an excess of matter, stars, black holes, oceans, and us. They called it detritus, deposited by the sea current, but the gravestones, bricks, charred wood, the relics of a vanished hamlet along the bay. From lost sorrow remained, dread, despondency, shrinking from the absence. As it happened, you can't live and love in a dying world. Power over meaning is lost. In our wake, the owls will remain, collect the best of our bones, build their nest, no longer need to seek safety in branches. Across the street, our neighbor's storm door swings open. On the threshold appears one of the twin toddlers, teetering on the edge, holding with one arm outstretched a miniature model car, an offering to passers-by. Next, his brother appears running his miniature model, racing through the field of golden wheat in his hair. They are now balanced on the top step. Each takes flight in their father's arms, landing on their seats in the double stroller. Mom appears with their baby sister tucked in a sling. They stroll off. Other neighbors stop to chat and tease with smiles. What matters is this. This is what I get to watch from my bedroom window almost every morning now. Lights shining from the other side of the river. That's my mama's hand lifting the veil from the chiseled face of the city. Something noticed seen more clearly to discover from the weight of silence floating in the sea of memory. Invisible from the visible is empty of things that have already said about a word what a word cannot say. Lights depravity wealth, scarcity, a cloud's personality. Mama says lies prey on the truth, yet truth and lies prey the same way. Mama never fades, savoring the form and fragrance of things, humming a sweet serenade for the coming spring. She's my poetry mama, poetry mama. She bickers with my muse. Mama says stop trying to catch my boy's verse for a little fame and fortune. <clears throat> or wasting time trying to smooth with a who's who, kissing up to some poetry tycoon like Paul Muldoon. Mama says the world must be measured by eyes, tells me to let life pierce me like a pin, watch the moon rise in an empty sky, let more dreams take me for a spin. My mama says there'll be poems like this, poems like this, Mama says, there'll be poems like this, Mama says. <clears throat> the little poem keeps the world at a distance. So small one could accidentally step on it. It's got next to nothing, thin as a piece of linen, a pulse with no body. One wonders how it could survive on a page. It stands motionless, listening to itself pass and return again and again. 
no longer curious, it stopped adopting and responding to the changing conditions, stopped exploring ways to describe a universe in flux or mimic the crying out of another species facing extinction. It fears how little power language now has over the truth, says the world, the word beautiful will remain while the world vanishes. When asked where it's been, it answers, nowhere. Why? Am I boring you? The transubstantiated moments, <clears throat> peeling, cutting, dicing, grating, chopping, mixing, I am measuring life in cups, teaspoons, tablespoons, half, a quarter, an eighth at a time. Here I find solace away from the magnetic field of ego and the eruptions of anger percolating below the surface. I am living with carrots, celery, potatoes, tomatoes, onions, mushrooms. I only fear the fire of a serrano pepper. I am spicing a day with bay leaves, basil, curry, salt, pepper, grains of paradise. Notice how good and earthly happiness can smell, as if someone had folded up time and poured it into a six-quart cast iron pot, where a collision of ingredients offers happiness plenty to eat, the sense leaking through the lid among strong, my body becomes the soup itself. With short poems, you only have to dress them in a white shirt, black tie, creased pants, shine shoes. You don't have to know where they've been or where they're going. It's none of your business, too. Think like the shadow trying to catch up, like the leaf that is about to fall. Think like the moss growing on a stone, like the mural after the image disappears free. We live our childhood over again, but we don't want it back. Four. Lies are like bubbles underneath the truth, building their own nest. Five. Snow melts on the mountains, looking through glass as we can see. Trees turn green. Women give birth. Flowers shrivel up. Dirt shoveled back in the graves. Rain folds heart feet. Six. After listening to the birds, it is impossible to conclude that we are the most beautiful voice in the world's music. Seven. I need to lighten up and paint my life with faint brush strokes. Eight. Winter writes with a cold darkness, snow, ice, and death. Nine. Give me a poem about the smell of snow. <clears throat> The long diminishment. You'll come and see gradually your own limbs. Your parts will let you know they aren't what they were promised to be on day one. The tie, every time it is knotted, it becomes a bit frayed until it is completely unraveled. Doubling of the cells depends on whether your body has the basic 40 or premium 60 multiplier plan. A rogue gene might come threatening to hitch a ride on some old numbered chromosome that will kill brain cells until you're unable to complete a sentence, forgetting its beginning. The clock. We are ticking away in every part of the flesh. And who oversees all the clocks scattered throughout the body? Can I cash in the benefits of experience and the influence of perspective? to buy some more time. Studies suggest that reducing by half food intake in animals extends their lifespan. But if semi-starvation is to gain more time, I want to continue my love affair with chocolate and would rather burn to umber like a maple tree in the final days of fall. I dreamt a poem about a young man at sunrise, sitting on the beach, his feet and hands anchored in the wet sand, staring at the waves flaring up. The dream was written in red by 
by another, and the longing to crash like a wave over him belonged to another. Mine was only a dream, which I could not get rid of. The air pump and vacuum have handwritten notices out of service. Parked next to the diesel pump, there is always an empty Ford Fairlane, one fender and two doors, with a printer, a primer coat, rusting rocker panels, ding the size of a bullet hole in the windshield. One island of pumps is cordoned off with yellow caution tape. Thick black stains of motor oil cover the ground. A greasy film floats on the surface of the windshield cleaning liquid. Paper towel dispensers empty. Even in daylight, it is always dark here. At the pay inside shop, you can buy chips, candy, gum, porno magazines, rubber, soda, cigarettes, and lottery tickets. <clears throat> A team of three men of all different ages hang outside, soliciting to fill your tank, clean the windshield. I always pump my own gas, but I give a dollar to each of them. I feel for them. Before I leave, one invariably grabs the door, mumbling something which scares me. Turning into the highway, Pandora flutters a tremolo of two notes of Bill Evans' intro to Blue and Green followed by Miles' muted trumpet play, the 12-bar theme, like the voice of an old friend in the passenger seat giving me advice to slow down, take it easy. Far away from the connectivity, without the weight of time, it was difficult to relax here. It was not difficult to relax here. Pause in the middle of sentences, words erased by the silence. Lost hours on the frontier of happiness, the mind hikes along. Here you can rent your own sun for the day, by the sun that can open wide to a heaven's labor, breathing fire, deafening sight, just enough and not too much to illuminate as you paddle along the coast of Blue Mountain Lake, imagining what the Iroquois learned from the beavers. I established my own spacing of Long stockings of clouds dressing the big sky, as invisible hand of the painter continued the finishing touches on the mountains rolling over everything. Try to translate the language of the lake, <coughs> listening carefully to intervals between its parts of speech, admiring its patience with the accents of things that interrupt flow, tree trunk trees endlessly collapsing in its lap. Watched loons scribbling messages in cursive, the high fidelity calls of a crow, imagining it's bullying a tree sparrow, perhaps just giving warning. At night, the moon's marble face spangled on the lake, questioning what fate stars were signaling each night. Attentive to winds snapping their fingers through the canopy of trees, rustling the traffic of spirits, stepping across the membrane of darkness, putting your breath into something that is not there. Fear, fear is out for a lot this year. Fear is out to win the hearts and minds this year. Many are eating, sleeping, and setting their sights on fear right here. Fear knows there is enough, more than enough fear to feed everyone. Fear wakes up hungry every day. Over a cup of coffee, reads the news, keeps up the date on fear. Fear is picking the scabs off and letting old wounds appear. Fear is out for a lot this year. There are the principles of fear and the fear of principles. There is a bull market of fear. There are pop-ups of fear, a search engine, default settings for fear. Fear bullies the fearful. The fearing cheer the fearsome. The White House has the grand puppeteer of fear, the commander-in-chief of fear. Fear incubates in the mouth with droplets of hate ready to flutter. Quarantining, sheltering in place, self-isolation, social distancing, masking. There's no flattening the curve of fear. 
fear of being alone, fear of being with others. One half fears the other half. Seventy-five fears the twenty-five other. There's no washing our hands with fear. There's no haggling down with fear. Fear has a meaningless disagreement with we the people. Fear avoids besides, among, between. Fear's a family man, loves his wife, goes to church, raises his children to be God-fearing. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. Give yourself up to fear, the transubstantiated fear, the body and blood of fear. We no longer play. We only pray with fear. I had a dozen dress shirts, half the cold weather, brief with spring, three short sleeve with summer, all purchased from J.C. Penney's seasonal closeout sales, button down, tougher Oxford cotton for winter, four white, two sky blue, all linen for warmer weather. This was before easy to maintain, non-iron, wrinkle-free, ready wear. It was 1954, the year Willie Mays made that circus catch in the World Series. It cost 70 cents to see Blackboard Jungle, and I became a bulletin boy. I was 12. My mother told me from now on I had to iron my own shirts, water boy surplices, and press my pants. I already knew how to shine my shoes. The same year she taught me how to cook a perfect fried egg, peel onions, dice celery, stuff a turkey, and make a little more salad. She told me she was too busy now caring for my bedridden grandma on the second floor. She showed me how to follow her strict order in ironing the shirt. Above all, she said, pay special attention to the seams and borders fastening everything. Start with all the hidden places, the yoke first, Next, the pleat in the middle of the back panel, then the barrel of the cuffs. Wide up the sleeves to the armhole. Again, seams and borders on to the front and double layer of fabric that coaxes buttons into holes, the background eventually for a tie. Finally, the front panels of the pocket. This marked the stage of independence for me. I was transforming a rumpled heap pressing something into its proper shape. I was plowing crossroads of fabric across borders and seams. I was finishing, caring for myself, becoming a big boy. I came to love the smell of baked cotton coming from the steam, learned to be more delicate, releasing the pressure, fascinated with my own mastery, the gliding motion of the iron. Drudgery too many, I learned that routine could be precious. What the nuns would call daydreaming, I would linger over the smallest detail, like the edge of a barrel of a cuff, or this, <clears throat> or this scene between the yoke and arm hole. I can teach you how to swim, show you how to streamline your body, move through the water like a fish and use a two-beat kick. How to catch and pull the water, breathe from both sides, and I cannot teach you how to write a sestina. I cannot teach you how to create a prose poem out of a sestina either, but I can show you how to make a roasted beet salad, which will keep you slim, how to make a fig vinaigrette on the side, with eggplant parmesan for your main dish and a fresh French baguette sprinkled with pesto and olive oil rather than smothered in butter. But I cannot explain how we can fix our body politic. If I tried, I would be called just another left-wing lunatic. Just like some poet trying to put a glossy patina on a mediocre sestina, pointing the divining rod, watching words like water hidden in the earth. I'm trying my best to finish this poem before the lights in my head go dim. I could show you how to do a lot of other things, but the words are starting to vanish. To change the subject, my wife and I are coming to call the climate crisis assisted suicide. Ultimately, we're going to have to choose up sides. 
as the denial of warming becomes a pandemic. Survival might depend on your knowledge how to swim, knowing how to swim. The morning brings everything back. Our goddess of space exploration is or orbiting, estimating, mapping the ratio of Jupiter's oxygen and hydrogen, its mass, gravitational and magnetic fields, variations in its Trump, or Trump temperatures and Trump, Jesus Christ, temperatures and cloud capacity. A thought is driving to climb higher and higher in the, perhaps soon touching the planet's outer rings. There is wonderment, but the universe of my mind is rather small. It has no polar magnetosphere, or craving for the answer of Jupiter's <coughs> origins and structure. The Earth's deep winds pulls me back. I turn as the Earth turns, while Jupiter rains in diamonds, spins its turbulence, spreading her wings. I see bombs casting above the sky of Odessa. I read the news of another young man walking home murdered without provocation. And I hear the next door neighbor's dog bark at something or nothing. I go to the Rittenhouse Art Fair, searching for images for which Holmes <clears throat> yearn. A siren tempts me toward a painting of Western Ireland's rugged landscape that unfolds like the pages of a book, channels of sandstone, bald in a clenched fish punching back at the ocean and wind. I walk the edges of thought, instantly settle down on the slope of grass and moss, lost for a time in a place which I am a part. Here, my grandfather once stood, taking a final look <clears throat> at this landscape <clears throat> to follow his heart for a new life for which he yearned across the ocean where dreams would become his new boss. America, the chaos, boundless opportunities of urban real estate, owning a bar, four buildings, and founding an oil refinery. He was a whirlwind until he was struck on the head with a grappling hook. Now, I have that storybook yearning to return to the wind and moss of that landscape painting that captured my heart. Only in parts, we never see them in full, like describing a man exiting from the speeding train not bear or cougar big, coyote, the song dog, hiding darknesses. Their dens on the leafy edge of the city's wilderness where we play, where the spirits of our ancestors rest. And in the poorest membrane of our imagination, that once, like the coyote, to slip deep back into the forest with the animal in us that is still screaming. I took all the dishes from the drain rack, stacked them on the shelves, took the pots, stowed them in the drawers, careful that there would be no clanging of metal, planted the spatulas and wooden spoons in the large crock jar, polished the blades of the carving knives with the tail of my shirt, parked them in their holders, sponged the beads of water from the sink, dried and polished the head of the faucet, ran a wet cloth over the surface of the granite tops, dried and buffed the surface with a soft cotton cloth, filled the kettle with water, placed the tea bags on the counter next to your cup, swept the floor, shut off the light over the range, checked to assure sliding glass doors were locked, left the pillows on the counter turned on the nightlight in the living room, shut the sliding door to the stairway so that no cold air could crawl up, our, up to our room, closed the bathroom door behind me so that the sound of the electric toothbrush could not be heard, and quietly sunk under the comforter, everything in its proper place as it should be. As a boy, my mother took me to wakes. 
I figured she just wanted company offer me as an excuse to leave before the praying of the rosary and after the keening started. Perhaps this was another lesson on how to act, what to say in an awkward situation. She always had a prepared script of how to communicate condolences to a grieving family, a small story to tell about the deceased. To the grieving children, she always tried to give comfort, letting them know how proud the deceased was of them. It was always about giving comfort, she said. As I grew older, I became skilled at the etiquette of condolence, accomplished in the appropriate message to write in a sympathy card or post on the website of a funeral home. I even became somewhat of a counselor to others who would invariably ask, what do you say or do now? Yet I am at a loss of what to say to the family of ice and snow for the growing number of funerals for dead glaciers. In Switzerland, a funeral was held in the Alps to honor the dead glacier named Pizor. Another in Iceland for Ogojo, a 700-year-old, six-mile-wide glacier. Black veils covered the faces of some women. Men wore stovepot heights and tails. Mourners hiked 8,000 feet to stare at the hollow bellies of the glaciers. Only a narrow artery of snow now remained around the neck of the darkened ghost. In Iceland, a plaque placed on a boulder with a message to the future of warning. Sorry to the sons and daughters of ice and snow. Sorry to everything once touched by the glacier's tongue. Sorry to the rocks once carried long distances by the flow of ice and melting snow, cutting deep gorges and valleys into mountains, no more. To the unseen hands of the sculptor no longer chiseling the rippled, wrinkled patterns formed in the earth's surface, the stone polygons on the coastal plains. Gullies and valleys cast into multicolored bands, folds and fissures carved into ice fields. Sorry to melt water lakes, Water disappearing now in crevices and ruins, a lake one day on the next. Sorry to the unquenched thirst of woodland creatures, trees, and plants. Sorry to the mother clutching her daughter in Tuvula, waiting home waist deep in water. Sorry for all those who are tending their gardens when fires rage on the other side of the fence. My disquiet finds a place to rest. As I slide my feet across the slate floor and feel the warmth under me, comfort is the soft upholstery of memory. The tiny porcelain swan perched on top of a rock that I found on a beach in Yudin. Cairns on the windowsills, determination of those weathered stones from Harlem to Maine Downs. Sheer pleasure of my fingers tracing the carved details of the Nasukis we found. The photo of a young girl in the girls' sports work program in Cusco, Peru, flexing her muscles, the spider in the dusty transom tangling a web. The squadron of house sparrows outside the backyard door, tails fan, beaks out, peacefully squabbling over the breadcrumbs we share. Peace in knowing that the dead still live on in me. Peace in the grammar of forgiving. Perhaps it won't be all bad. I cannot stop the world from burning, but I can add extra bittersweet chocolate to the flowerless chocolate cake dressed with strawberries topped with coconut whipped cream. I cannot replace the mounting loss of plumage, of song, of calls. But each morning we can enjoy the songs of the sparrows as they squabble over the breadcrumbs in the backyard. I have no red button to stop the exhilarating melting of Greenland's ice sheet into the ocean. But I can pull my pants over my belly button, slide my glasses down to the tip of my nose, walk with a slow shuffle into your studio, 
mumbling my nonsense things just to make you laugh. We can decide what can happen for us in the moment. I can take your blouses from the dryer, iron them better than the dry cleaner, place them on the hangers, and put them in the closet. That's it. <laughs> Father Michael Doyle, I don't know if any people heard, knew of him, but he was a legend in Camden, uh, Sacred Heart Parish. And he was a man who came here from Ireland in the early 70s. I met uh, Michael Doyle three times, one time at a church for a funeral of a friend of ours, and uh, twice at the uh, Nick Virgilio uh, Haiku Festival. And he and Nick were very close uh, friends. But he was also, he also attracted a great following of people to Sacred Heart, many of them from Philadelphia and the suburbs, because he was such a, an eloquent uh, orator and he gave such uh, great uh, readings of the gospel and interpretations of the gospel. So, I, and he has a book of poems which a good friend of mine, who I thought was going to be here tonight, uh, titled, It's a Terrible Day, Thanks Be to God. So, uh, what I want to read, he, most of all that he's written here are in prose, but he has interspersed in these poems, wonderful poems. And I'm just going to read a part of the introduction at the end to this. My eyes have been opened in Camden, and my soul has been strengthened. I celebrate that. I celebrate the heroic struggle of the people with their churches and community organizations. I salute those who generously shared in Sacred Heart's efforts to help the school, part of Camden Housing, the food sharing, the medical clinic. I haven't seen God in a burning bush, but I hear him speak from the burning issues of the day, and they are all in Camden. And now Annie's blessing gives me hope. So I celebrate. By the grace of God, I am not paralyzed by all that I cannot do into not being able to do the bit I can do, at least not for long. Looking at the big picture, I most surely fail, but I want to qualify that on my gravestone. Give me an old lump of stone, unhoned and weather-beaten, to stand upon a place I lie, big and be enough to sit upon, and small enough for tired feet to touch the ground, their small children's jump will be safe on summer's afternoons. Cut my name on the north side where the sun seldom stops to shine. Cut it deep where the rain can run and drops can hide and tiny mosses grow to green the letters level there. Cut 34 for my birth, I'm told and the partner year it waits to meet. And side by side they'll stay in stone till time and tide will wear them down below the best that eyes can do. And there are three words of measurement to sum my days of sun and cloud and dreams of dark and dreary nights and sleepy spots by warm walls and times when all the weight of things paralyzed the strength I had to do the bit I came to do. So, artists, with your chisel sharp, have a glass of winter wine and cut the letter E for me, and then a sip, and then a cut, till failed, it carved imperfectly. And please, my friend, no dismal thought to stop at that and say no more. One word more, for goodness sake, to make a plea to passing wind. Tis all I ask when I am gone. One kindly word to qualify. He failed. Give me nicely. Michael Doyle. Mm -hmm.